During much of the time of the dinosaurs, most of the world had very stable temperatures. This means the only seasons are the dry and wet seasons that come and go with the distribution of rain. Over prehistoric Mongolia, it is the wet season, and the local floodplains are full, providing ample habitat for countless dinosaurs. Dredging through the muddy swamps are the massive Dinochiris, powerful six-ton herbivores that stick out against the landscape. But these are mostly gentle herbivores, much like the Sauralophus, though these hadrosaurs stick closer to the water's edge, leaving the feathered giants to wade through the deeper waters. On the drier earth, you can find even larger dinosaurs, the sauropods, like Nemegtosaurus, feeding on the tall trees and staying away from the wet ground that they could sink into. Far smaller than any of these colossal herbivores, however, is the lean and fast-moving Gallimimus. This male is currently foraging near the swollen river, feeding on just about anything he can find, but he is not alone. Following in his shadow, rustling through the leaf litter, are his offspring, a group of 20 chicks that only hatched a few days ago, covered in fine fluffy down. Like modern emus and ostriches, Gallimimus males are the ones that take care of the young. Upon hatching, the infants will stay with their father for 12 to 16 months, until they are large enough and experienced enough to take care of themselves. At about 30 centimeters long, they need all the protection they can get, as nearly any predator could make a meal out of them. But they are in safe hands, as despite looking frail, their father is 6 meters long and weighs almost half a ton, being one of the largest of all ornithomimosaurs. Because of his size, there are very few predators in this forest that pose a serious threat to him but he keeps a lookout for the multiple Tyrannosaur species that patrol this forest. For the next year, he will guide and watch over his children, and with 20 to keep track of, it's a full-time job. Fortunately, the chicks hatch with a covering of downy feathers that not only insulates them, but helps them blend into their surroundings. If found, they can always run, something their family is built for. Adults can run over 55 kilometers per hour. Normally, the father would be feeding from the river, acting not too dissimilarly from a giant swan or duck. But there are crocodilians in those waters, which could easily snap up one of his brood and disappear before he could do anything. So he is sticking to solid ground, where he and his chicks have a better chance of spotting and escaping predators. Now he is feeding on the various plants that are growing well with the coming rains, snipping off leaves, twigs, and nuts, with his long, toothless beak. As he feeds, some of the leaves and nuts fall to the ground, and his young eagerly pick up the fallen debris, preferring that which is freshly fallen to what has been laying on the ground. The young even make a game of it, trying to jump and catch the falling leaves as they descend, while also making sure not to bump into Dad. As the adult male pulls back on a fledgling tree, he sees a small dinosaur hiding in the underbrush. It is a nesting conchoraptor, an oviraptor just over a meter long. Currently, this male is brooding over a clutch of eggs that he shields with his body and his outstretched arms. The conchoraptor doesn't move, hoping his camouflage pays off, but the Gallimimus looks directly at him as he chews his food. The much larger dinosaur considers taking one or more of the Oviraptor's eggs, but he knows from experience how vicious these feathered terrors can be when defending their nests, so decides against it. Not only that, but with his young sticking so close to him, they could be caught in the crossfire. Better to stick to food that won't fight back for now. Continuing to move through the forest, the father takes note of the herd of Sorolophus moving slowly through the trees, mowing down everything in sight, and protecting their own young. Tired from a long day of watching over his family, the male needs to find a safe location to rest for the night. Though whether his energetic children will allow him to get a full night's sleep is up in the air. There is more rustling, and the tired father is slow to respond, 
but when one of his chicks cries out, his body is flooded with adrenaline, and his large eyes quickly see a scared hatchling and what was attacking it. Out of nowhere, a three meter dromaeosaur, Adosaurus, has run down one of the chicks. With little effort, the predator nudges over the fledgling youngster, causing her to slip and fall to the ground. As she tried to get back up, the Adosaurus placed one foot on her side and then pierced her with its large, killing claw. The juvenile Gallimimus flailed, but her attacker spread his wings out to keep balance. He lowered his jaws to bite her neck when he heard a few fast footfalls behind him. Looking back, he only got a glimpse of the clawed heel that struck his skull. The father Gallimimus was on the Adosaurus in a flash. Needing only four strides to close the distance and step down on the carnival's head. With almost half a ton of force behind his stomp, the Adosaurus was dead in an instant, most of its body disappearing beneath the wet leaf litter. There was barely even a sound. The male Gallimimus pulled his injured infant to her feet and looked her over. She had a puncture wound to her ribs, but it hadn't gone deep. Dinosaurs were tough. She'd survive this. The two were soon surrounded by the other chicks, all chirping in surprise from the ordeal. Their father led them away from the Adosaurus' body, hoping that any other predators would feed on it instead of going after his young. Now to find a place to rest, and hope the kids would keep it down for a while. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the surprisingly large speedster, Gallimimus. Gallimimus' first remains were discovered during the Polish-Mongolian paleontological expeditions, which took place in the Gobi Desert between the years of 1963 and 1965. These were historic expeditions and uncovered a lot of very important specimens, in what would later be called the Nemet Formation. Many Ornithomimosaur remains will be found, including some near-complete specimens and ones at different growth stages. Most of the remains would be distributed between Mongolia and Poland, but it wasn't until 1972 that the genus would receive its name, that being Gallimimus bulletus. The genus name meaning chicken mimic, as the front of the neck vertebra looked very similar to birds in the Galeiformes family, which included chickens, turkeys, and quails. The holotype was the almost complete specimen, and was at the time one of the best known ornithomimids. Since then, additional finds have been made on later expeditions. Gallimimus was a theropod, and was the largest member of the Ornithomimidae family. It lived in the Maastrichtian age of the late Cretaceous, 70 million years ago. It grew to 6 meters in length, stood 1.9 meters tall at the hip, and weighed between 400 and 490 kilograms. At first glance, Gallimimus looks very similar to other Ornithomimids. However, on closer inspection, we can see it had many unique traits. Let's start with the head, which was small in comparison to the body, but was long compared to other members of its family. And unlike them, the jaws widen at the jaw tips, so instead of creating a pointed beak, it appears almost spoon-shaped when viewed from above. The lower jaw does curve down, as does the upper jaw, until the end where it curves upwards, meaning that there was a gap even when the jaws were closed. But the tips of the jaws would have had a keratinous beak. Gallimimus lacks teeth, but it did have soft tissue structures in the beak called columnar structures for grinding down food. More on them later. The orbits are very large and face sideways, giving Gallimimus a wide field of view, as despite its size, it still needed to have good vision to spot potential threats. However, the eyes themselves may have had limited movement in the sockets, forcing the animal to move its head around whenever it needed to look at anything. Like ostriches, it's likely Gallimimus' eyes were larger than its brain, and it's even thought it might have had a similar intelligence to modern ratites, which is insane much. Its neck had 10 cervical vertebra, giving it fair flexibility. Each had hollow chambers for air sacs to lighten the skeleton and aid in respiration. 
It had between 64 and 66 vertebra along its neck, back and tail. Gallimimus's arms were quite similar to its relatives, being reduced in size and strength. The bones were long, thin, and usually had very little muscle attached to them. The hand was also small, being proportionally the smallest of all Ormophomimosaurs. It had three fingers. The thumb was the strongest, the second was the longest, and the third the weakest. Each finger was equipped with a claw that was slightly curved, compressed sideways, and had a deep groove on each side. The arms were even found to be incapable of grasping, making them almost useless for foraging or hunting. So what were they used for? Well, the discovery of quill knobs on the forearms of other Ornithomimus missiles show that this family had feathers. If they left marks on the bone, these feathers must have been large, so it's believed that Gallimimus and other members of its family evolved display feathers along their arms and would flaunt them to potential mates or even use them in threat displays to rivals or predators. It's highly likely Gallimimus also had a covering of feathers, though to what extent, or if these were flight feathers or downy feathers, is unknown. And you're free to envision it with as much or as few feathers as you like. Moving down to the legs, they were long for theropods, but normal for an Ornithomimosaur, being straight and thin, built for speed. It's believed that Gallimimus may have reached speeds between 42 and 56 kilometers, about as fast as a lion, though Gallimimus would have been able to keep up this speed for much longer distances. Other Ornithomimus have been calculated to reach speeds between 70 and 80 kilometers. Though this may be a trade-off from Gallimimus's larger size. One other feature that Ornithomimids, including Gallimimus, have that differ them from other theropods is that they lack a dew claw on their foot. Why they lost it while other lineages keep it isn't known, but this also may be an adaptation for speed. So what was Gallimimus's diet like? Ornithomimosaurs are generally seen as omnivores, leaning more towards herbivory, but a huge amount about their eating habits isn't known for certain. With a lack of teeth and small skulls, it's easy to see them pecking at the ground, snipping off leaves and twigs, and even occasionally going after small prey like lizards, mammals, and dinosaur hatchlings. But let's go back to the columnar structures that were discovered in Gallimimus's mouth. These were most comparable to what's seen on the beaks of waterfowl, like geese and swans, with the best modern analogue being shovelers, though not as fine and flexible. This has of course led to the theory that Gallimimus would have fed similar to ducks, geese, and swans, wading through shallow water and filtering everything from plant life to small microbes. Now does this mean that this was the main way that Gallimimus fed? After all, Ornithomimids do seem to favour environments that have large bodies of water. Well, we have to consider that Gallimimus was very large, and if it lived entirely by filter feeding, that would make it the largest ever discovered terrestrial filter feeder. Also, the area it lived in was a seasonal floodplain, so the waterways would greatly shrink during the dry season. With that, it's highly likely that though capable of gathering food similar to modern waterfowl, Gallimimus fed on a wide range of plants and some animal material from time to time, changing its diet throughout the year and taking whatever it could. Being large means it would have had a longer digestive tract, and this would have been beneficial for a more herbivorous diet as well. Finally, let's cover how it grew. Looking at the youngest specimen known, we can see that the orbits were larger and the snout shorter, while the skull itself was proportionately bigger. The ribs on the neck vertebra didn't fuse to the vertebra until the animal reached adulthood. The hind limbs remained proportionally the same, but the forelimbs were very short, so why did they lengthen as adults? This may be to have more space for their feathers, which the adults would need for display, but also, they may have used their feathers to shield their eggs while brooding, something they would only need as adults. So, Gallimimus, a species that is much more than the fast ostrich dinosaur from Jurassic Park, though that movie did put their name in the public mind. As we can see, 
there's a lot more to it, such as just how large it was. It may prefer to flee rather than fight, but you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of one of its kicks, that's for sure. So what do you think of Gallimimus? And for my question of the week, do you see Gallimimus moving in large blocks like in the movies, or as a bit more of a loner as I depicted, which was based on emu behaviour? What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching. Oh, <laughs>